back, everybody. Time once again for another episode of Living Hope, a weekly journey designed to provide hope, inspiration, and education for those living with pancreatic cancer. Sharing the real-life stories of those really affected by this disease and how they deal with it on a daily basis. With the woman who knows all about that journey, she's been on it for a few years herself here, 19 years and counting, I believe. Our host, Roberta Luna. Hey, Roberta. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. 19 years and still counting. And we'll be <laughs> counting for a very long time. Oh, we're going to get up in the 40s or 50s. This there, you go. Right. there you go. There you go. Well, today I have two very special guests with me, actually. They came all the way from Iowa. And I will introduce Kelly Barber because I can say her name very easily. <laughs> but since you all took bets on how I would screw up Wendy's name, then I'm going to let Wendy introduce herself because of her last name. So, Wendy, would you say hi? Sure. Uh, Wendy Chichek. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Roberta. And go online and see how she spells it. There's a few extra letters that don't look like they belong in there. So. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. I, I really... I'm really good at messing up last names. I didn't want to do that to you coming on, especially since you guys came all the way from Iowa. I know not just for this, but I do appreciate you being here. Um, you've been staying in San Diego, so I know you had quite a drive just coming down to visit us today. But I wanted to talk a little bit about your personal journeys that you've had with pancreatic cancer. And Kelly, if we could start with you, um, I'd like to know something about your husband, about George. I don't really know a whole lot about him. Would you? Kind of tell us a little bit about him before he was diagnosed. Um, he was a stay-at-home dad with our daughter, Megan. Um, he was a postal carrier. Um, and then after she was born, he stayed at home and only worked on the weekends oh. with her. Oh, how nice. That's, that's a nice uh, turn of events there, huh? Mm -hmm. Give you a chance to go out and work and let him kind of be at the stay-at-home dad. I think that's really cool. Absolutely. Especially in that, those days, you don't really hear that happening very much. It's a little bit later in time. Um, what did he have symptoms of pancreatic cancer or how did you know that he was sick he was having some like pain in the evenings um but we really didn't find the cancer until after he, he suffered a heart attack um he had a heart attack and then had 100 percent blockage so he had a stent put in and then um started having complications so they did a TC ct scan found the cancer on the tumor of his uh, pancreas and at that time it hadn't spread anywhere but because of the heart surgery we had to wait six to eight weeks we did another cat scan and it had spread to the liver so at that point he started treatments I, I've, I've heard many times usually somebody will find the cancer like if they something to do with like their appendix or you know um, something else I've never really heard of anybody having a heart issue and that's how it was diagnosed because of that it's almost like was that you know a blessing that he had that happen first yeah um, and it was something that our oncologist said to him too like isn't it a blessing that you had the heart attack because then you wouldn't have found you know the cancer because he really had no other symptoms I, no was he having any heart issues at the time or was that no. kind of a surprise too it was a surprise oh. he had actually like like i said he was working on weekends and he had got up that morning and he was having some left shoulder pain. He actually Googled it before he went to work. He worked the whole day. And then he called me. He goes, I'm going to go to the urgent care. And then I met him there. And So he sort of self-diagnosed himself but worked a full day first yep. and then went to urgent care. Yep. Wow. That's um, really amazing. It kind of sounds like he was that type of person. He wanted to make sure to take care of his family first even before himself so yep. yeah well thank you for sharing that with us i, I know um, these stories can be difficult but we want to put a face behind this disease and not just talk about statistics and things so it's very important to you know put a face behind all this so he said that he didn't really have any symptoms mm -hmm. um for the pancreatic cancer and it was diagnosed through what they were looking at for, for his heart attack through a ct yep okay did he receive any treatment for pancreatic cancer? He did. So after waiting the six to eight weeks, um, he started chemo. Um, he did chemo, rounds of chemo for about 14 months. Um, no radiation, but he tried several different chemos. Um, one of them 
we mail ordered from Canada because our insurance wouldn't pay for it. Because oh. at that time, and another thing that the oncologist said, you know, like with his diagnosis, they would have just said, go home, you know, get your affairs in order. And, but he was able to do chemo for a year. And every time did you have to order that through the mail or was he able to get it through? We his... always ordered it through the mail. Because the insurance would not cover it. Correct. Do you remember what type of chemo that was? It was Zalota. Okay. And how long ago um, was your husband diagnosed? Um, he was diagnosed in December of 2004. Yeah, 2004. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's no, no, he's no, been gone 15 fine. years. Yeah, this yeah. past February. Oh no, I, I I get it. Sometimes I have trouble remembering yesterday. So I know <laughs> when you go back in time, you know it, it's hard to remember those dates. Especially, I think sometimes with the grief and what we go through, we want to almost forget those days. So I'm sorry if I'm bringing something up again. Like I said, I really feel it's important for people to understand that what we're talking we're talking about real people and families and fathers and mothers, and we really want to put a face to that to that disease um and he did treatment i'm sorry you said for 14 months or he survived for 14 months he did treatment up until the 14th month oh, the 14th month yeah and did he ever go on hospice did you use palliative care or what so um we were at we were at the oncologist and for treatment but his counts weren't um, well enough for him to do it and he was having a hard time breathing Little did we know he had blood clots in his lung, um, but he's like, let's do one more treatment and then figure out what to do. So he ended up having treatment and then um, he went into the hospital for five days and that's where we found out that he had the blood clots in his lungs. Um, and then he was there five days and at that point I called hospice in. They came in and put a bed at our home and I brought him home. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry, please. I'm. I'm. Thank you for sharing this with you. I know. I know it's difficult. I brought him home, and I had to have the neighbors and a friend help me get him into the house. And that was on a Wednesday evening, and he died on Thursday. So he was home for a very short time. And you um, have a, a daughter. Which how old was was Megan at that time? Um. Megan was born in 2003, so throughout his illness, she was a year, two years. She was a little over two years when he passed away. And Wendy, I think you did something really unimaginative. It's not something that I have heard of a lot of people doing or, or even, I, I just really admire you for doing this. I don't know if you even know what I'm talking about. I but. Don't. <laughs> And, and I and I think that says a lot for who you are. Um, you actually made a life-changing um, decision to come and support your sister. What was it that you did? Well, I lived, um, my mom and I lived two hours away. And um, I had recently lost my job. So, you know, I was kind of working an interim job. And a woman that I worked with um, six years prior um, worked in Des Moines area where Kelly was. And she said she was sitting in a room one day and a light went off and because they were thinking about you know they needed to hire someone and she thought of me so it was just i i th believe things happen for a reason and you know it just everything fell into place um you know i so i made the decision to move to des moines kelly was there with the young child and didn't have any family around so um, it was kind of a no-brainer to make that move and then mom followed yeah, you say it was a no-brainer, but again, like I said, um, <laughs> it, I've, I've come across a lot of families, and unfortunately, not just families, but friends, they tend to do a one, one of two different things. They either come closer to you, or they tend to go away. So I hear, unfortunately, more people going away because it's just, you know, it's a, such a horrific disease, and it's, it's very 
troublesome so they don't want to deal with it or, or can't so I, I just really admire you and I didn't really know that before until I really started doing a little <laughs> research on you guys that it said that you made this move to help support your sister so I, I just think that's really amazing and I I personally want to thank you for that because oh, being you. you know a survivor and also a caregiver it's something that's really important to have that support and to have that family and you know to have you and, and your mom help you know Kelly and Megan through this I'm sure took a lot off of, of, May, of Kelly, I hope. So mm -hmm. um, how did you feel when your sister moved down here to help you out? <clears throat> well, it didn't surprise me at all. Um, <laughs> when George first got sick, she started doing a lot of research and she found a chat, chat room, John Hopkins chat board, and she shared that with me. And pretty much that was my lifeline the whole time George was going through his journey. Um, that's where I met Mary Ann Cheney, and you know that's how I became to know about Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, is through that chat room and <clears throat> having a place to go to ask questions and um, just find out information. I, it's um, I'm surprised that you mentioned the John Hopkins uh, chat site because that's actually how I found uh, Pam um, Acosta Marquardt, really? the founder of, <laughs> of Pan Canis. Because when my dad was diagnosed in 1998, there was nothing out there. So I was doing the same thing, even though I do tell people, don't Google pancreatic cancer. I'm better at giving advice than I am at taking it. <laughs> and I did, but I, I'm thankful that I did because I came across Pam as well. And though the you know, Pan Can wasn't around yet, it just gave me something to to look into and to know at least when things changed family-wise, I at least knew now there was an organization I could go to. Um, you did something to handle your grief, and actually both of you have participated in that a great deal, and as well as Megan at some point. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I wanna say a a Advocacy Day, um, and Advocacy Day is a yearly event that's hosted by PanCan, where we get to go to Washington, D.C. and personally meet with our uh, members of Congress or their staff and share our personal stories and urge members of Congress to increase funds for pancreatic cancer. You did that, is that a way how you handled your, your grief and how you helped to support your sister? Yes, um, so, you know, after George passed away, um, I went, my aunt and I went to a symposium in Chicago. Um, I believe Pancreatic Cancer Action Network put it on. And at that time, Iowa was, all the states around Iowa were all purple. Iowa didn't have a presence of, of any organization or any Team Hope, I think was what they were called before. Mm -hmm. um, and I told my aunt, I said, I need to change that. Got home and then um, I had actually been contacted by PanCan to go to the very first advocacy day um, because I I had signed up to be like that person that somebody could reach out to that was dealing with pancreatic as a caregiver. Um, so they had my name, they contacted me. That was, I went to Washington DC all by myself. I was the only one from Iowa, um, met a lot of great people, but that kind of started the yearly event. Um, I went to my very first one alone the next year somebody in Des Moines father had been diagnosed and she wanted to start an affiliate. I went to their very first meeting because I had been to one advocacy day. They're like, Hey, advocacy coordinator would be a perfect fit for you. <laughs> so <laughs> there I, I became advocacy coordinator and kept attending advocacy day every year. I've gone to every one, um, except past couple of years, they've been canceled because of COVID, but um, and then my daughter also started going. I went to a few by myself. Then Wendy tagged along, mom <laughs> tagged along. I was gonna Megan. ask if they tagged along or did you volunteer them <laughs> no, and they decided to do uh, it? <laughs> you know, after I went to the first one, I'm like, you have to go. I said, I can't explain it. I said, but it is just, it's just an awesome event. It is and it's, um, it, it, it's changed my life. It made me want to get more involved and to bring more awareness to it. And like you said, we haven't been able to do it in person the last couple of years. We've done a virtual, which 
um, was still a good connection, but it, I miss that one-on-one. -on -one. We really need to do that one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm very happy to say that actually next year we will be going again in person. So I'm really thrilled and can't wait for that to happen. It will be in June. I don't remember the, off the top of my head the exact <laughs> date, but we'll keep everybody informed on that. And if they are interested, I can really stress that it's really important to go to Advocacy Day. And I, it makes you feel like you're doing something. Mm -hmm. So you went basically to for you know to handle your grief and to bring more awareness. What age was Megan when she first? Did, and I remember hearing her story, and I'm telling you, she just had us all in tears. I think she was five, five, almost six, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she she her story was very compelling. I can still see the photo, uh, the, yeah. the drawing that she did that. Um, they took her up on stage and showed that. I think there wasn't a dry eye in the house, and she's continued to go since that day, correct? Yes. And she's how old now? She's 17. Wow, that's really amazing. That's really amazing. When Wendy, what is your take on it? Because you're looking at, I think, advocacy, they may maybe a little differently than maybe Kelly is, or maybe the same. What was your take on it? I guess I look at it as a way for us to raise our voice and to, you know, to... Um, get the funding that we need to advance the research um, to find early detections and to, you know, make advances in um, pancreatic cancer. And just to, you know, you meet so many people from across the United States. We've met so many friends and the connections and the stories. And, you know, it's just, um, it's just a family of people that, you know, you, you just, just, you know, yeah, it's always it's uh, a good experience. <laughs> it's, we always say it's a family none of us want to belong to, but at the same time, it's a family that I can't imagine not having being. in my corner and, and being there because it's, it's just made a, a very big difference. If you could give anybody advice as far as advocacy day or getting involved, I'm asking Wendy, what, what would you tell people? I would say if anybody wanted to get involved in any part of... Um, volunteering the um, Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, you know, uh, they have the Advocacy Day, they have the walks, um, uh, but Advocacy Day, I would say it's a way to raise your voice, obviously, and, you know, people, I mean, everybody's at their own comfort level, you know, when they lose someone or they have someone dealing with it, you know, you have to kind of meet them where they are, so, you know, They've got to feel comfortable going, um, but don't be scared. I mean, there's plenty of people. If you're alone, you got plenty of people to support you. Um, you know, we recognize new faces because we, you know, uh, there's been a lot of us. Nor, you know, the same people going every year. So when you do see a different face, you know, you kind of tend to um, introduce yourself, or you know, you ask, you see the purple, you know, and you ask, hey, where are you from, and you know, what's your connection, and um, it's just... The one thing I can add is for Advocacy Day, for those people who want to go and aren't, don't, can't speak, you don't have to, you're not being forced to do it. There's True. plenty of people who will share their story, and eventually you will want to share your story as well. But always take a photo with you and just, you know, at least just hold that up. Um, it's to the point now where the Congress and the members that we meet with, they see purple and they, they are happy that we were there, which mm -hmm. is really nice. If... Um, I, Kelly, you had this quote, if anything good had to come out of our family being affected by pancreatic cancer, it's definitely is the friends who we have met along the way. Um, that's something that is very true, and, and I don't know how you were able to come up with that after losing your husband to that, but it, it, it really hits home, and you know, I want to thank you for that and, and continuing what you and Wendy do, and Megan as well, and I know your mom, Lois, comes out too and we you know we hit the halls and and tell the stories and i want to thank you because i know this is very very difficult to share this but i do appreciate you coming and showing the emotion it's again it's important and if you have any last minute words or advice or or pearls of wisdom would you like to share them now um like wendy said i mean you may feel alone but you're not um, we have made so many connections um, throughout the years with our Purple Strides and our Des Moines affiliate and Advocacy Day. Um, Megan still stays in contact with kids that she has met at Advocacy Day. They FaceTime, 
uh, Logan from Massachusetts, Stephanie from West Virginia, Rosemary and Grace, who live in Tennessee now. Um, those connections are what makes us united. And I agree, and I think when we first go into this, I think we go for our own personal reasons. But eventually that changes and we go for each other. I mean, I advocate just as much for you, and I know you advocate for all survivors and all those that have lost somebody. So um, we start out going for our own personal reasons, but it, it's amazing how well it changes and how much we become family. Wendy, do you want to add anything to that as well before we go? Um, I would just say, you know, anybody that's newly diagnosed or families that are going through that have been newly diagnosed, you know, reach out to your resources. Um, the, you know, don't just think of it as a, as a death sentence. There is hope out there. There are connections that you can make and that you can, you know, you don't have to feel alone. And just on that, um, like I said, because I'm really good about giving advice and maybe not taking it, but please do not Google pancreatic cancer. If you want more information, please go to pancan.org. Mm -hmm. There's people there that can direct you and send you on the right path. So please, pancan.org. And I think it's 8772 pancan, and Paul will give that to you at the end as well. So thank you. Did you want to say something else? I have one more. The, the patient central, I think, is key to you know, at pancan.org. I think that's a, a really good resource um, for newly diagnosed or, you know, families, caregivers to look at. Yes, thank you for adding that. And also there is a caregiver survivor network as well that they can talk with other people going through their, their circumstance. So thank you guys for, for joining us and for coming down all the way from Iowa. <laughs> yes. Thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you. Love you guys. Love, Love you. you too. So there you have it, another reason to tune in each and every week to Living Hope, a weekly journey designed to provide hope, inspiration, and education for those really living with this disease, sharing the real life stories of those really affected and how they deal with it on a daily basis. And if you'd like to share your stories, please, we're always looking for more people to come forward, share their journey, where they're at, how they're handling things, friends, family, or people personally affected. Just contact us here at the radio station, OC Talk Radio. And if you or anyone you know needs help right now, there's a place, Patient Services at 877, the number two, PAN-CAN. That's 877-2-P-A-N-C-A-N for more help and information. That's the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. And I'm Paul Roberts with OC Talk Radio, inviting you to join us again next week for this ongoing journey of hope.